All right, let's talk about our next phylum, which are the flatworms. And so I want to give you a brief intro, and then we're going to talk about some of the different classes, and, um, and then we're going to play with some flatworms in lab. So now we're looking at the protostomes, okay? You remember that sponges didn't have any tissue, that it formed the different germ layers, that it have any kind of symmetry. Then last week, the cnidarians, they had radial symmetry, and they formed some tissues, and they formed two germ layers. They were diploblastic. Um, but now we're looking at organisms that form uh, three germ layers. And so again, we're going back to the same figure we looked at several times. Um, this is from your book, and the sponges, they don't have any germ layers. And then the cnidarians, your jellyfish, your sea anemones, your corals, they are a little bit more complicated. They form two germ layers. They're diploblasts. And if we look at our phylogenetic tree, those uh, phyla, um, you see where those are located here in the phylogenetic tree. And so then now we see that uh, the, the organisms that are left, their shared derived characteristic is that they are triploblastic. And that also comes, what also comes with triploblastic is they also have bilateral symmetry. And so, um, of course, we can break these groups down into the protostomes or the deuterostomes. And it has to do, you know, these all form that mesoderm, that third germ layer, and it's sort of where it's formed and how it's formed determines whether you're a protostome or a deuterostome. And again, we infer that this um, gives us an insight into the evolutionary history of these organisms. Uh, another thing about the protostomes, you recall, is that the blastopore, where that uh, in, in evagination occurs, invagination occurs, that will become the mouth in the protostome. Protos first, stone, eat, or mouth. So this is the mouth first, whereas the deuterostome, that, that blastopore will become the anus. The anus forms first. And that's what we're seeing here. And this is the same figure that we've looked at several times here. And so just to give you an idea, again, that we use these clues in early development to help us you know, there, there are suggestions that, that these organisms are more closely related, that they all have this unique form of development because they got it from their common ancestor. Um, and so again, these triploblasts form both uh, ectoderm, endoderm, and mesoderm. And since we're talking about the protostomes, the mesoderm forms near the blastopore. And so let me get my pen here. And so that's what we're showing you right here. And there's another red arrow here that uh, when those cells form, they form in a unique spot and that is shared among all the protostomes. Okay, and you also remember that once you have a mesoderm, you also can form a new cavity called a salome or a salomic cavity. And then if you go back to our earlier discussion, there are different ways you can form a salome, and sometimes you form mesoderm, but you don't have a salome, and those are called uh, acelement. And then there you can have a pseudocelement, or you can have a true cellament um, in the protostomes. And so today we're going to look at our first protostome, and this is the phylum Platyhelminthes, and these are the flatworms. Um, and so of course they're triploblastic, and they have bilateral symmetry. And the blastopore forms a mouth, so they have all the protostome characteristics, but they don't form a salome. They don't have a salomic cavity. Um, and so they're acelement. So this is one of those groups that uh, forms mesoderm, but did not form a salomic cavity. So again, think about the, your salomic cavity. That's where your organs go, and that's true for a lot of organisms. Um, these are more complicated animals and they have organs, where do their organs go if they don't have a cavity to stick them in? Well, they're just kind of embedded in that mesoderm tissue. And so they don't really have a cavity for them. They're just kind of there surrounded by mesoderm. Okay, so if we look at the platyhelminthes, um, you'll recall from our taxonomy, you know, what's the next layer uh, level down? We're in the kingdom Alima Animalia. And below kingdom is phylum, and of course, we're in the phylum platyhelminthes. And so kingdom, phylum, class, 
class is the next taxonomic division. And so we've got four classes that we're going to look at here in platyhelminthes. And um, so if you look at uh, these different classes, you see the first one, uh, Turbularia. These are free-living organisms. They're not parasites. Um, and these are also called the planarians. And this is what we're going to look at in lab. The other classes, these are not free-living. They're all parasitic. And so they all you know, depend upon another organism for their life cycle. And these are important because um, they can cause some uh, diseases in humans and vertebrates and livestock and that. So that's why it's important to understand um, what these what these classes do or what's in these classes, all right? So we're going to talk about each of these classes in a little bit more detail. So let's talk about the, the planarians or the free-living flatworms. Planarian is really just for the freshwater version, but there are um, lots of marine planarians, um, so flatworms that live in the ocean. The ones that we're looking at in lab are freshwater. Uh, again, planarian is just freshwater. I, I misspoke there. Uh, so flatworms that live in the ocean are not planarians. They're just uh, in this class. Um, and the phylum as a whole are called flat worms. They're flat. Why are they flat? Well, a big reason is it's for gas exchange. They don't have a respiratory system. So we're starting to see development of uh, systems in these fish, in, the, er, in these fish, in these um, organisms, and they're getting more complicated, but they don't have a respiratory system. So they don't have a way to get gas in and gas out. And so by being flat, you increase the surface area. And you'll remember when we talked about cells, we talked about the importance of surface area to volume ratios and the importance of being able to diffuse things into the cell and out of the cell. Well, it's the same at the organism level. If you don't have a way to pump gases in and pump gases out like we do with our respiratory system, then you need to be able to let the gases diffuse in and diffuse out. And so having a higher surface area will improve that. And so that's why flatworms are flat. And again, there are lots of large... Um, Flatworms that live in the ocean. Here's a picture of one. Very cool looking. There are a few terrestrial flatworms, but be, again, because of this requirement to respire across their body surface, they have to be moist or wet. And that's why you don't see too many terrestrial ones. Um, and when you do see them, they're only in moist habitats. They have to be wet so the gases can diffuse across their body. That's why most of the organisms in this phylum um, live in the water. Okay, um, and so here's just a generalized body plan of a um, turbolarian, you know, a free-living flat, uh, flatworm. And you can see how it's getting more complicated. Compare this to the cnidarians from last week. You've got you know, more tissues and you're starting to form organs and um, you've got a little bit more organization here. And so if you just look at this cross section, you can see several different kinds of cells and several different kinds of structures that these organisms have. And so this is um, just demonstrating the increasing complexity that we see in these more, recent, more recently evolved um, phyla. So the flatworms, um, well, the sponges didn't have any tissues. Cnidarians had tissues, but they didn't have any real organs. Um, you know, flatworms have organs and they have systems. They've got a muscular system. They've got an excretory system. They've got a reproductive system. They've got a digestive system. They have a nervous system. And so um, they've got quite a bit more complexity. And so if you look at, say, the muscular system, You'll notice in this, gra in this figure here from your book, you've got a couple different kinds of muscles. You've got circular muscles and longitudinal muscles. Longitudinal means along the long axis. And so these are muscles that would make it, you know, turn left and right. And circular go around the body. And so they're going to make it uh, contract and they're going to help it to extend and, and, and uh, you know, extend out and come back. And the longitudinal muscles are going to help with that as well. Um, you also notice that for movement, so that helps them kind of steer, but for movement, they also have these cilia on the bottom. And you remember that we saw cilia on a lot of the protozoans and the single-celled organisms we looked at earlier. Now we're seeing ciliated cells. And this is the 
primary means of locomotion. The ciliated cells are mostly on the ventral surface, which allows them to move around. Um, the excretory system is pretty interesting, and here's a figure showing, highlighting just where the ex excretory system can be found. And it's not as complicated as, say, in a vertebrate, but they have these cells called flame cells or flame bulbs. And um, these are cells which are used for osmoregulation or used to get rid of waste. And then you see those flame cells are connected to channels that have pores that go to the outside of the body. So this is a way for them to collect waste or to collect water or whatever they need to get rid of. And then they've got those pores that they can expel it out of their body. Here's a figure from your book showing... Um, here in the upper left, you've got the flame cells, and and so like these are again um, flagellated cells, uh, similar to the collar cells that we saw last week with or uh, two weeks ago in the sponges, um, and uh, they are used to help filter things out of the uh, out of the body, and then move it down this tubule, and then you've got a pore where you can excrete it. So a little bit more complicated excretory system. Okay, you can notice here, this is a diagram that kind of shows the reproductive system of a, a planarian. And you'll notice that they've got both uh, testes and ovaries, so they're hermaphroditic. Um, but they also have the ability to reproduce asexually, so it's similar to what we talked about in the hydra last week. They have both sexual and asexual reproduction, and we'll see that in a lot of our uh, organisms, that they can reproduce both sexually and asexually. A lot of times it depends upon the environmental conditions. Um, and you also see, you know, it has both penis and vagina, has a seminal receptacle, other reproductive organs. Um, they don't, uh, I don't believe that they fertilize themselves. So when they reproduce sexually, they will uh, exchange gametes with another flatworm. Now here's the digestive system, and again, this is interesting. Again, you know, compare these things to your digestive system or things that you're familiar with. So their digestive system is spread completely throughout the body, but you see a lot of surface area, so it um, makes it more efficient for uh, absorbing food into the body. Um, remember, they don't really have a, a salomic cavity, and so that's another reason why these are just kind of spread throughout the body. Um, now the uh, mouth is the opening um, the slit on the ventral surface, basically, and the pharynx is the muscular end of the digestive system that can poke out through the mouth. So the mouth and the pharynx aren't the same thing. The pharynx kind of sticks out of the mouth, and they can extend it if they want to pick up food, and they can retract it if they need to retract it. We'll look at this in lab. Um, here again, showing you where the mouth is underneath, but this is a blind gut. They don't have an anus, so when we're thinking about similarities to the organisms from last week. You remember that like the hydra and them, the hydra only had a blind gut. It, it only had a, a one opening. And same thing here with the, uh, yeah, with the planarian. And here we show you the, the pharynx again. And, and the place where the pharynx retracts to is called the pharyngeal chamber. And this is a term that will come up later. We'll see that other organisms have a, a pharyngeal chamber um, you know, it's kind of the, the back of the mouth, top of the throat area, and a lot of other organisms. Um, here's a figure from your book, also showing you the digestive system of a couple different flatworms. And again, you see how it's kind of cool. It's spread throughout the entire body. Um, so you don't really have a circulatory system where you, you, know, you can digest in one area and then you can have the circulatory system carry those molecules to the rest of the body. You just have the digestive system spread throughout the whole body. Uh, here's the nervous system. And so now we're seeing a much more developed nervous system. Well, last week we talked about the Cnidarians probably had the first nervous system, but it was just a nerve net. There was no central nervous system. Now we're starting to see the beginnings of a central nervous system. You've got cerebral, cerebral ganglia, um, he's got more organization. You've got larger nerves that run laterally on the body. Um, so you're seeing more complexity here as well. Um, one of the cool things about uh, planarians is we said they reproduce asexually. And um, sometimes, I don't know if they really bud, but if a piece of a, um, if a, if a flatworm gets cut in half, a lot of times both halves can survive. And so if you cut the head off of a 
planarian, it will oftentimes regenerate that head, which is pretty cool. Um, and there's been some cool studies where they have trained these flatworms, and they teach them um, that if they go to a lighted spot, that's good, and they'll, they'll find food there. Although they normally avoid light, they are trained to go to a light area because there's always food there. And then if you take that flatworm, cut it in half, and then let the two pieces regenerate, so the tail piece will regenerate a head, that organism will also already remember to go to the light and go find food. So it stores, you know, although it has this beginnings of a central nervous system and, the, and cephalization and the beginnings of kind of a, uh, what you might call a brain, the memories are stored like in the body. And so when the brain is regenerated, um, the memories are already in the body. That's wild. That's so cool. Anyway, I got a link here where you can read up on that. And uh, we'll look at some videos of, of planarian regeneration in lab. Okay, so that's the first class of our platyhelminthes. And uh, we'll talk about some other parasitic flatworms in the next lecture. See ya.